presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of helping build the great state of Idaho. He pioneered a strategy that's bankrupted hate groups all over the country, including Idaho's most visible symbol of intolerance, the Aryan Nations. A conversation with Morris Deese next on Dialogue. Good evening and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marsha Franklin. It's drawn attention to Idaho for decades. The Aryan Nations compound in Hayden attracted hate mongers and the national press with its message of hate towards minorities and Jews. Once the staging ground for cross burnings and a training ground for neo-Nazis, today the 20-acre complex outside of Coeur d'Alene is just a shell, stripped bare of most of its propaganda its leaders forced to hand over their keys to what had been their home and headquarters since the mid-1980s. My guest tonight was a major player in that transformation. Morris Deese is a trial attorney and founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama. Long a civil rights activist, Deese turned his attention to so-called hate groups in 1980 when he founded Klan Watch, which kept tabs on the growing numbers of those groups. In 1987, he won a landmark $7 million civil judgment against the United Clans of America by successfully convincing a jury that the group was ultimately responsible for the lynching of a young black man by two of its members. Deese used the same strategy a few years later to bankrupt another group called White Aryan Resistance, several, several of whose members had mauled an Ethiopian man to death in Portland. And last fall, Dees led a team of lawyers who won a $6.3 million judgment against the Aryan Nations in Hayden when several of its members shot at a woman and her son as they drove by the compound. As part of the settlement, the infamous property was seized. Human rights activist and Idaho native Greg Carr recently bought the grounds for a quarter million dollars. He's now talking with local human rights organizations about the future of the compound. In April, Dee spoke to a packed crowd celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations, a leading group in the fight against the Aryan Nations. He told the audience that without such groups, the Aryan Nations would not have been defeated, but that there was still much more work to be done. And Mr. Deese joins me now to talk about those goals as well as his career. Welcome to you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And to our viewers, we should mention that because this program is taped, there will be no phone calls tonight. First of all, in your mind, and you've, as I mentioned, I've just give, gave a brief overview of some of the landmark cases in which you've been involved. What's the significance of this case in Idaho? We, we've heard for years from our governors that this is a, quote, small band of malcontents. At the same time, people are heralding this civil judgment as big news. So sometimes it's hard to get a handle on how significant it really is. Well, I agree with the governor that this is <clears throat> and was and probably always will be a small group of malcontents. But it only took one Timothy McVeigh to blow up the Oklahoma City building. And this group of malcontents brought people in from all over the nation. They had chapters in some 25 states and state leaders, a lot of young, aggressive people. Most of them recruited straight out of prisons. They were running the organization. But this group has done a lot of damage. Over the years, members and followers of this group have done things like rob armored cars in California of several million dollars, robbed banks, a series of banks, blew up the spokes from the view office down on some of the satellite news offices. They killed the Denver radio talk show host Alan Berg, tried to kill a federal witness, and probably encouraged many young people to commit acts of violence all over this country, a lot of them we'll never know about. Many people watching this, and I assume other cases in the strategy that you've used to get civil judgments against these groups for acts uh, perpetrated by their members, might have been a little skeptical about whether this could be accomplished or not. As I mentioned, a $6.3 million judgment, certainly the Aryan Nations doesn't have $6.3 million, right. but it, it did bankrupt them. Why do you think the strategy has been so successful and was successful in this case? Well, first of all, let's talk about the money. This case wasn't brought for six million dollars. It was brought to get compensation for the injuries done to Jason 
and, her, and, and his mother, Victoria Keenan, because they were chased, shot at, and beaten up in the middle of the night and terrified. And they had tremendous long-lasting damages from that. The six million dollars is what the jury thought this horrible and egregious conduct by Butler and his guards was worth. It was like sending a message to other people who would commit these type acts. Five hundred thousand dollars would bankrupt Richard Butler. In fact, to put it in one sense of the word, he was bankrupt to start with. His ideas were bankrupt. And I think the jury just simply validated that for the community. And, but, but the strategy has been successful of, of going, after the criminal aspect is over, going after civil judgments. When well, did you first realize that this could, could well, work? Well, first of all, all of our cases have not just gone followed criminal prosecutions. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, you almost could say the civil stuff brought the criminal on because if Victoria Keenan hadn't been encouraged to pursue her case by local human rights people, uh, the sheriff's office down there did little or nothing, even though one of his citizens was chased down the road and the car was shot up, and they knew who did it two days afterwards. They already knew who did it, but they didn't want to rattle Butler's cage, so to speak, and cause him to be upset out there. And so they just let her suffer all by herself. But with the help of local human rights people, six months after the thing happened, she finally got up enough courage to pursue it. But in a lot of the cases that we do, like the case in... Uh, say, uh, Oregon, and in this case, too, the people that were ultimately held responsible wasn't the ones that got convicted in a criminal right. case. That'd be pretty simple. It was people like Butler and Tom Metzger and others. The strategy uh, was designed, really, to do what civil law cases have always done, is to punish with financial judgments those people who do things like make faulty automobiles that kill people, faulty lawnmowers, or medical products that hurt you, or a Walmart company, for example, and no disparaging Walmart, that might hire guards that are untrained, that have no skills, that are not, uh, rat guns are not checked out, who have criminal records, who drink on the job, and who use assault rifles to chase people off their parking lots and shoot them. We can immediately see how that's horrible. That's all we choose Butler for, is, is, is negligent, hiring and disciplining and dealing with his security force. Do you foresee this same <clears throat> strategy being used uh, for groups that may be by minority groups uh, that <clears throat> are espousing hateful messages towards white people? Well, I think this strategy, which is old as the English common law, several hundred years old, has been used in this country for a long time, could you be used against anybody, any group, any company. If there are minority groups in this country, like Minister Farrakhan's group, who, who encourage violence, and you can show that his members did this act because of something he did, not just a speech. A speech is not enough. That's First Amendment rights. You've got to go beyond that. But if Farrakhan, for example, who speak, preaches hatred to Jews and to white people, if he had guards guarding some of his facilities and they did the same thing, and we had the chance to represent them, we would. Let's go back to the point you made about law enforcement in Kootenai County, and you made it as well to the assembled audience at this uh, human rights celebration. I'll paraphrase, but you, you said basically it's almost unheard of to leave a prosecution to the victim itself. You really feel that, uh, that the sheriff's office up there dropped the ball in terms of uh, pushing well, for, for prosecution? First let me say that Rocky Watson is a sheriff now. He's a first-rate sheriff. He supported everything we did, and he's a member of the Kootenai County Human Relations Task Force. But they've had some problems in the past. Butler's done so much in that community, I think they was like, felt like, well, you know, he's a junkyard dog, and let's keep him inside the junkyard, and we just won't bother him. Well, in this case, the facts are pretty simple. <laughs> the night of the shooting, some sheriff deputies came out three miles away from the compound because the car had been shot and went in a ditch, and a farmer called the sheriff and the, our clients were there. The guys who did it had left, but there were ample witnesses to, to know who they were. And all the sheriff's d deputies did was just photograph the car, and my clients took it on home with them. In fact, one of the deputies turned to my client's husband, who happened to be called there to help, and he said, look, this, the tires on this car are slick, and if you get on this road with these slick tires again, I'm gonna put you in jail. That's how the victims, in most states, if, you, if people were chased down the road and shot at a car riddled full of bullet holes and they were beaten up and you had witnesses to prove it, you, you would take the car in as evidence, get fingerprints, and surely, surely, 
you wouldn't just send them home like that. But it's, then the next two days later, the the chief investigator goes to the compound and says to the chief security guy, Jesse Warfield, who was driving the truck that night, he said, look, now, we've got to stop this chasing people down the road and shooting at them. You've got a march coming up two weeks from now, and if you, and I will come talk to you after your march. Most law enforcement people have said, you're not marching two weeks from now. I'm taking you to jail today, and you don't leave it up to the victim to prosecute. Do you think they were afraid, or do you think they had just become so inert? Well, first of all, they said to the victim, do you want to prosecute? If somebody murdered somebody, and this was assault with intent to murder, you wouldn't say, victim, do you want to prosecute? It's a crime against the state of Idaho or the state of Alabama. The law enforcement moves in. Does this rise to the level of something that needs some investigation by an outside entity? Oh, I don't think so at all. I think, I think that it was just uh, kind of business as usual, which is unfortunate. The same thing happened in the South in the civil rights days. Blacks were beaten up and law enforcement people just turned their backs. They were kind of used to the Klan good old boys, you know, doing this kind of thing. And I think what you had here was a, a situation of a, a couple of rural deputies who, these clients were half Indian, Mrs. Keenan's half Indian. They were in a 22 year old car and they were scared to death. And, and all, they didn't blame them. I mean, this was the tragedy of it all. Jason Keenan, who's a fine young man, the most peaceful people in the world. She's worked on environmental issues. They don't believe in guns. They said, well, you must have done something to make these people do this. But you still don't think it rises to an uh, investigatory No, I don't situation. think. I don't think so, no. Now that, uh, <clears throat> now that the co compound has been, has been seized, uh, and both, uh, both you and I have been out there since then, and I'd like to get your impressions because you saw it for the first time mm -hmm. recently. Uh, about first of all, what you what you thought as you walked through that, that infamous place, but also what you think should be done with it. Well, being there for the first time, where my own demise was plotted right there by some of Butler's people in, in, in the past, and Robert Matthews and others, members of the order, the ones that killed Allen Berg, I got kind of a feeling which come kind of about the scene of the crime, you know, like. Uh, 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 it's kind of eerie to be out there where I know all these people that I know the names of many, many people who are now in federal prisons who've been through that place, and I've heard so much about it. I've seen undercover photographs from it, so I almost knew it intimately. But just to stand there in the middle of a compound where, where hundreds of young people have come to be indoctrinated by Butler, it just made me feel, first of all, proud to be a team of lawyers and people in this community that put it out of business. At, at secondly, though, frightened that, that, that this might happen again in this country because there's an old saying back home, it doesn't take much yeast to make the bread rise. Well, it doesn't take many hateful people like Butler spewing his hate, whether through his Internet site or whatever, to cause some young person to decide, well, gosh, if I don't do something now, our country's going to go and be destroyed. These Jews and these blacks and these Latinos that are coming in here, they're going to ruin the America that I love, and therefore i got to do something. And that something could be to take a machine gun and go into a synagogue and shoot some innocent Jewish children, just like one of Butler's guards did out in California last, last August at a Jewish synagogue. Do you get the sense then <clears throat> that there is so much in your mind evil or so, much, so many memories there that the place should be raised, should be torn down? Torn down, well... Greg Carr was, is a very wonderful citizen of his state who has stepped out and said, look, I'm going to buy this compound. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with it. He's got a nonprofit foundation. And he, he thinks right now that they may take the chapel where Butler held the indoctrination ceremonies and there's so many videos of it. And it would make an interesting kind of museum. And then I think he wants to tear everything else down and put a school there where people could come in from the whole Northwest and even through satellites could join in all over the United States to learn lessons of tolerance and acceptance and, and love and understanding. That may be a good thing for him to do. And I really, you know, hadn't studied it enough. Uh, I was just glad to be... Uh, but you think some of the buildings should probably be pulled down? Well, most, most all the buildings are because they're rickety and, and they leak and, uh, you know, they have no central heat and air. Uh, it's, uh, I can say one thing for Butler's crowd, they, they were tough. I mean, they lived out there with a few wood stoves. They must have frozen to death up here. I talked to Pastor Butler, as, as you know, they, there were several uh, of his crowd mm -hmm. picketing your speech. And he, 
he maintains that the real problem right now in America isn't even minorities anymore. It's what he calls white race traitors like mm -hmm. yourself. Well, sure. And of course, you travel with a lot of security. You have, as you mentioned, had your life threatened on numerous occasions. What keeps you, uh, well, first of all, how do you respond to this idea of being a traitor to your race? Well, I understand Butler's upset. He lost his home, he lost his organization. Um, I think that what we do, and not just myself, but the other lawyers, is upholding the highest standards of our country, of our race, so to speak, of our Constitution and our laws. I don't think we're betraying anybody. I think Butler and his people are betraying young people who come to listen to them, leading them down the wrong path, leading them into, into things that they would never do otherwise. Butler has a lot of leadership ability, and he's proven that. He ought to be using it for something good. What Butler says is irrelevant. Him standing there last night with a, a, a banner that had a swastika on it, and 600 good people from uh, the around, surrounding areas coming to that human rights banquet, it was just a great reminder to them as to why they came. And I want to say this one more little point, too. I think that the great, massive majority of the people in the Northwest, in particular in Idaho, have no interest whatsoever in the philosophy of Butler. And I think this case showed the importance of standing up against people like him. And it wasn't just me that did it. This case wouldn't be possible without the work of dedicated people around Coeur d'Alene, the Human Rights Task Force, Norm Gissel, Ken Howard, Tony Stewart, and others, who just simply said, we're not going to let this victim of injustice suffer out there all by herself. And we're going to make sure that the people are prosecuted and some civil action is taken. Interestingly, I asked him if he felt sad about it. I mean, he literally, you can see his coat still there, his hat, other, many other items, of course, had to be left behind, paraphernalia and propaganda. I asked him if he felt sad about that, and he said, no, those were just material items. They meant nothing, that the cause was still alive. But in fact, that those material items, all the pamphlets, the, the uh, pictures, the tapes, are very important in spreading the message of these groups. They aren't just material items. They they carry a yeah. message, and that message is increasingly moving to the Internet. Yeah, I think what you saw was what was left after right. we went out and removed everything right. and stored it all, and it was still a ton of stuff left. Yeah, those things are important, but, but you're so right, and Butler's aware of this. The group that we have to fear the most today is not a group that's meeting in Coeur d'Alene or Alabama back in the back rooms of some tool shed plotting to do something. It's the virtual group that's meeting on the Internet. There are over 358 websites today, and there was one in 1995. And these, these hate websites attract people that would never get caught dead coming to Coeur d'Alene to mess around with skinheads, or couldn't find a Klan rally if they tried to. They are sophisticated, high-tech, college-bound students, a lot of them low self-esteem, looking for something, like young people are trying to find themselves, and they click on one of these websites and they see things that, oh, I could, that's why I'm not getting what I job I ought to get. That's why somebody else has gotten this place and I didn't get this particular opportunity. And then they they get the emails from other people around the country and uh, who, who believe the same thing. And then what you end up with is people getting together. Oh, there's somebody else that believes like I do. So you have a virtual group and they can do it in the anonymity of their own homes and that makes it serious and dangerous. It's no secret that you have one of the criticisms that's been laid at your feet is that you characterize hate groups, that you, you bring a wide swath of groups in, uh, groups that are amendments of, or proponents rather, of the right to bear arms, for instance, have said, hey, you know, don't, just because we're <clears throat> in favor of that, don't include us as a hate group and, and other conservative groups. How do you choose, when you say that moniker, hate group, how do you choose well, what first falls of under all, that rubric? Well, first of all, I don't think it's accurate that First Amendment groups or right to bear arm groups are considered hate groups by us. If you scratch a little deeper, you might find that these groups are using these excuses to attract people, but underlying the leaders are very deeply involved in neo-Nazi racism or one thing or another. And then you have these militia groups out there, and they're not necessarily hate groups either. But they suck people in, and a lot of people they suck in and get this idea that our government is evil, and that our government is run by Jews. They call America's government Zog, Z-O-G, right. the Zionist Occupied Government. That's what Timothy McVeigh called it. 
And you know, we don't we don't take groups that are, have unpopular views and classify them as hate groups. It has to be a much more stringent criteria. Otherwise, the groups could sue us, and the individuals could sue you for slander. And they, and nobody's ever been successful for that. How do you all, how do you respond as well to another criticism that you are preying on people's fears, particularly maybe elderly Jews who remember the Holocaust? That every time something happens an event happens that you will send out more solicitations, for instance, for money for your, yeah. your group, well, that, that making people very uh, more nervous than they need to well, be. Well, first of all, let me say that we don't send out requests for funds from the Southern Poverty Law Center when something happens. We've been raising money for the Southern Poverty Law Center for 30 years, the same way every year, in, year in, year in, out. And issues and things change. When something happens around the country, like Oklahoma bombing, it doesn't necessarily increase contributions to groups like ours or the Wiesenthal Center or the American Civil Liberties Union. It really doesn't. We have a base of a half a million people who support us. And I think the criticism basically comes from people like Richard Butler and a few people who are extremist left or right. And it, it really has no basis whatsoever. Uh, you don't necessarily... You are very adept at raising money and you have well, won you have awards to. for doing that. Yeah, so that yeah. is definitely a, a, you know, a, a skill well, of yours. Well, sure, certainly. Uh, you know, I was, I've been I was finance director for Jimmy Carter's campaign. The NAACP went bankrupt because they couldn't raise money for their operations. The Southern Poverty Law Center runs our operation like a business. We couldn't have come to Idaho and then spent probably $250,000 to fund this case, to bring witnesses in, to have all the protection without funds to do it. And we represent our clients as if they're wealthy people. But let me, let me make an important point. Lawsuits are a fraction of what we do, only a fraction. The bulk of all of our money goes to tolerance education, teaching tolerance. We have 80,000 schools in America that use our videos, texts, and teachers' guides. And they are, these are kits valued at $350 or $400 each, and we send them all free. And you have a new website as well. And we have a new website called tolerance.org. We just launched it in the last couple of days. It's going to cost us about $3.5 million to get this website up and running. We have 92 employees. Twelve of them are full-time security people, made possible because our building was burned. You know, I think those kind of criticisms are really welcome. I don't shy from, and our support comes from all over the United States, not just from victims of the Holocaust. There are not many of those left alive. One, one more uh, point on this uh, before we move on. What about uh, the sense that some people have that because you are, uh, law enforcement is prohibited by law from spying, quote-unquote, on people, I guess you might say, collecting certain information, whereas groups like yours are able or have a broader latitude to collect that information, which you then share with law enforcement. Some people, some civil libertarians feel uncomfortable with that. For instance, writing down license plate numbers of people at, at KKK rallies. Mm -hmm. How do you um, justify that sharing of information? Well, first of all, law enforcement all over the nation writes down license plate numbers when people come to places where the members say that their goal is to do violent things. That may not be the best yeah. example that I chose. Uh, whatever though. it is, we don't, we don't break anybody's legal rights by anything that we do. You know, most of the evidence we gather comes from people within the groups themselves who are disgruntled. These people are paranoid anyway. I mean, they wake up in the morning looking at the person next to them and thinking that that person betrayed me last night doing something. And this case in Idaho, the two star witnesses were people that we didn't even know before this hearing. I mean, uh, Scott Dabbs and Charles Hardman both spent six months each at the compound on either side of the shooting. They had valuable information. That's how we got the information. It's, and, and it's interesting that Scott Dabbs was trying to find the FBI office in Coeur d'Alene before he found us, and they had moved to a new building, had failed to put a notice on that door they had moved, and all he wanted was to tell them what he'd learned if they'd give him bus fare back to Dallas because he was disgruntled. He, he knocked on Norm Gissel's office and he was our star witness because he, he gave us evidence that Butler tried to hide the SKS assault rifle after we filed suit, that he tried to sell and get rid of the property. Two things Butler denied on his deposition and we was able to prove information like that. We're rapidly running out of time. It just goes so quickly. A couple of very, very quick questions. Timothy McVeigh is scheduled to die. Do you think that's an appropriate punishment for this individual? Absolutely not. Uh, I wouldn't execute Timothy McVeigh. I think, uh, I, think the, uh, I think he's cheating us here. 
I think that the president ought to commute his sentence and say, we're not going to let this animal toy with us. We're going to keep him locked up in a cage for the rest of his life, and we're going to study him, and we're going to, he's going to suffer like everybody else suffered. He's toying with us, and he's using this book that he had people write as his going away thing. I think President Bush, even though I know he favors capital punishment, this time could do us a great favor. You speak of President Bush, that was another question of mine. Again, very briefly, what's your sense of uh, already what kind of legacy he may be building on civil rights issues? He's been complimented for the type of staff that he's appointed, at the same time criticized heavily for his appointment of John Ashcroft as Attorney General. Well, I think the jury's out <clears throat> on George Bush, Jr. Uh, he is a good man at heart, I'm sure. Uh, some of this compassionate conservatism he talks about, we'll have to see what it really is. I could make a lot of judgmental calls on him now, but uh, I hope that he appoints good judges, and I hope that Mr. Ashcroft, the Attorney General, uh, proves his critics wrong. At the, at the speech that you gave, you said since Martin Luther King, we've come forward three steps in civil rights and back two. What, in your mind, is still left to be done, some of the critical things? We have just a couple of minutes left. I think that Dr. King dealt with one issue, and that was desegregation, denying rights to blacks. There were a lot of other issues that were under the surface then, but, but this wasn't dealt with. Rights of gays and lesbians who were treated differently simply because of their sexual orientation, prejudice against people who are overweight or handicapped or in some way emotionally disabled, bias and prejudice against old people today. Uh, those are serious issues, and those are just a few. I'm not trying to mention all. And I think we ought to realize that only a couple of percent of the hate crimes in this country are committed by members of hate groups. Most of them are committed by our next door neighbors against the interracial couple. I think people, especially in a state like Idaho that has a couple of percent blacks and seven, eight percent Hispanics and others, you know, I know like most people in all over the country, they're no different. They need to examine themselves to try to question themselves about systemic built-in biases on things that, not tragic like hurting anybody, but whether a person gets this job or that job, just the first impressions, the stereotypes that you have, I think those are important things. Because by the end of this next, by the middle of this next century, this state will probably be 35 percent minority. The nation will be, people like myself will be in a minority. And so we're going to have to learn to live together. You know, we're living in a country now with states without borders. Uh, a world without borders, all, so to speak. And people in this state are affected by what happens in every state. And I know that the history of this state. You have rugged individuals who have strong religious convictions, individuals who I think are going to be tolerant and fair. I want to thank you for sharing some of your time with us as you visit North Idaho and Boise, Idaho. You've been listening to Morris Deese, the founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Thanks to you for tuning into this edition of Dialogue. Join us again, same time, next week. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of helping build the great state of Idaho. Dialogue is a production of Idaho Public Television. To purchase a videotape of this program, please contact Idaho Public Television at 1-800-543-6868.